All right, thank you, Rachel, for the introduction at the beginning of the session um, and to both you and Joshua for gathering us in this space. I also wanna say a thank you up front for everyone who is still here at the last talk of the day. I am excited to share about my experience uh, conducting speech perception experiments online, highlighting the power for these online experiments to democratize science and teaching. I'll aim to achieve two objectives in my talk today. The first is to share some findings that add to what we now know is a growing um, piece of evidence that online speech perception experiments are highly efficient and do yield robust data. The second objective is to share some thoughts on how online experiments more broadly can make science more accessible uh, for both researchers and participants. In my work, I study how we as listeners overcome the enormous amount of variation that we encounter when we listen to different voices and utterances. Our experiments typically require participants to listen to auditory stimuli and make subsequent responses on a computer uh, to each one. For in-person or in-lab experiments, this would typically require what's pictured on the left, a sound attenuated distraction-free booth, high quality headphones, and specialized software as well as hardware. As a disclaimer, I have to state that my first real dive into the world of online experiments was in late 2019, which makes me a relatively novel user of these online experimental methods. But this is when I started to wonder, is such a highly controlled listening environment really necessary? In the interest of achieving this first objective, I'd like to share what are now published findings uh, from my first foray into the online experiment world. This is work done in collaboration with my colleagues, Dr. Lynn Nygaard and Dr. Rachel Theodore, where we examined the time course of a phenomenon called lexically guided perceptual learning. We know that listeners use a whole host of cues to map the acoustics of the speech signal onto linguistic units. One of these cues is lexical knowledge. Imagine hearing a fricative sound that's between an S and an ESH sound. If that ambiguous sound is embedded into this word on the left, the listener hears that sound as an S as in dinosaur. But if that same ambiguous sound is instead embedded in the word on the right, the listener hears that sound instead as an SH, as in efficient. So as listeners are exposed to these ambiguous sounds in stable lexical context that bias them to hear either S or ESH sound, what we then see are changes in the listener's representations of their S and ESH categories. These changes in sound category representation um, are what we call lexically guided perceptual learning. In both the online and in-person versions of this task, uh, the lexically guided perceptual learning paradigm takes about 20 minutes to complete. So here, listeners complete an exposure phase followed by a test phase. And in the exposure phase, they complete a lexical decision task where they hear an ambiguous sound, such as a fricative between S and ESH. One group hears this ambiguous sound that's embedded in words, biasing them to hear it as an S. Whereas another group is biased to hear that same sound as an ish. So after exposure, the listeners complete a phonetic categorization task where they identify ambiguous sounds on a non-word continuum um, here either as asi or ashi. We drew our samples from Prolific and executed the experiments in Gorilla. We completed a total of six experiments in this um, publication, but in the interest of time, I'll share the findings from one. What will appear here are the results of the phonetic categorization task at test, 
where upon hearing ambiguous sound on the ASI ashi continuum, we measured the likelihood that participants heard that sound, those sounds as ASI. Here we see robust evidence for lexically guided perceptual learning, um, as listeners were more likely to hear the ambiguous sounds as ASI um, when they were biased to hear S during exposure, indicated by the red line, then when they were biased to hear the sounds um, as SH uh, during exposure, shown here by the green line. To showcase the high level of data quality that we see at the individual level, um, here are separate plots for each of the 70 participants at test. Um, where we can see the expected psychometric curves for every single participant. We only excluded 5% of our participants across the six experiments due to failure to perform the task. We did have to exclude 16% of the total number of participants due to failure to pass the Woods et al. headphone check that Dr. Theodore described at the beginning of the session. But this was um, a small price to pay, uh, given the speed of data collection. Uh, so for example, we collected data from the 70 participants uh, presented in experiment one in under a single hour. I hope what I've shared um, has supported the idea that online speech perception experiments are highly efficient and yield um, robust findings, even with auditory tasks that require fine-grained phonetic discriminations like the one I presented. I now want to turn to the idea that online experiments can provide us with uh, two things in particular, access to a larger and more diverse pool of participants, um, and also uh, more user-friendly experiment building interfaces for our students um, and research mentees. This is the figure I showed earlier. We replicated the finding with another N of 70 participants um, using a second stimulus set um, shown here on the right, meaning we ran a total of 150 participants within the span of about an hour and a half, which using in-person methods would have taken us weeks um, or even months. For his uh, master's thesis, uh, one of my student collaborators, Ulysses Quintero, is interested in recruiting participants who speak English and a second language. So in prolific, if we use our standard inclusion criteria, um, including this criterion of speaking English plus another language, we automatically have access to over 3,000 participants, which is magnitudes greater um, than what we would be how, then we would have access to using in-person methods. For his undergraduate honors thesis, uh, Justin Ao built a talker ID task um, in Gorilla on his own using primarily the tutorial support um, that is on Gorilla's website as a guide. I want to end by addressing the two questions about um, auditory research more broadly that Rachel shared at the beginning of the session. The first is, what do you think is the biggest challenge for auditory research online and how do you overcome it? Uh, as Jason mentioned, due to the pandemic, we have all been forced to some extent to embrace online methods more readily. But I think we are still very much in the process of establishing both the validity and the reliability of these methods. And one way for us to do this um, is to run online and ex in-person experiments in parallel so that we, not just as individual researchers, but as a field, can be reassured that our tasks can be successfully transferred across these different platforms. And the second question, what can auditory research gain most from online methods? Um, and my take on this is that with how quickly we can collect data from a whole number of different populations, we've essentially eliminated the data collection bottleneck. Um, adapting in-person experiments to the online world takes a lot of trial and error, and I'm still very much in that learning phase, 
But I think that the reduction of this bottleneck drastically changes um, the pace of auditory research and science more broadly. With that, I'd like to extend my gratitude to my recent collaborators, um, as well as to all of you for your attention. I look forward to your questions and comments. Excellent, Christina. Thank you so much uh, for those really um, careful thoughts. Questions? Uh, yeah, here's one for you, Christina. Uh, I was wondering if in your work you've observed the use of different exposure phase methods besides lexical decision in an online world, passive story listening, closed sentences, and if you've noticed any differences at test as a function of those expo exposure phase methods. Uh, thanks for that question. So again, coming back to this disclaimer that I'm a relatively novel user of um, online methodology in general for auditory research, um, we've only done some pilot work uh, look, using other kinds of exposure methodologies. So uh, we do, we're in the process of piloting a talker identification task where during the exposure phase, listeners will um, hear utterances spoken by specific talkers and have to indicate which talker they think they're hearing with the ultimate goal, being able to identify the different voices um, in the task. And so far, we haven't seen uh, any kind of noticeable difference in performance for in-person, in-lab versions of that and um, online versions. What we do notice is that sometimes participants will take uh, self-inflicted uh, breaks. Um, and so one lesson we've learned is that um, in addition to keeping the task relatively short, um, we will build in some breaks so that they're not leaving the computer for an extended period of time. But the short response to that question is, um, at least with chakra identification tasks and this lexically guided perceptual learning tasks, we haven't seen um, we haven't seen reasons to not transfer these into the online world. 